Well hello and welcome to another video. This one is uh, working with Jason in C Sharp. Uh, now before we go too much further I do apologise. <coughs> Excuse me for my voice. I've caught a bit of a cold so I'm a bit under the weather um, but uh, hopefully you can still understand what I'm saying. Some people even said it makes me sound sexy so uh, you, you be the judge of that although I'm sure that's not what you've come here for. Okay. So onto our user story, uh, as a developer, that's me or you, I want to parse or deserialize some JSON. And why do I want to do that? Um, so that I can work using object-oriented notation. Okay, so basically you're going to get a JSON string that's probably come to you over the web from an API, RESTful API for example. Um, and you want to take that and you want to restructure it or re recombine it at the other end or deserialize it into an object format that you can work with. Now our acceptance criteria, basically when we're done at the end of the video, you should be able to understand what JSON is and how it's structured. And using C Sharp uh, and JSON.NET, you should be able to deserialize JSON strings and work with them as objects. Uh, our ingredients, very quickly, uh, Windows PC to run Visual Studio. Visual Studio itself, obviously, I use the Community Edition. Uh, and then JSON Editor Online uh, is one of many online JSON editing tools or viewing tools. I just happen to use that one because I like it. Um, so you'll obviously need a web browser. Uh, and it's, it's a great tool uh, because it allows you to uh, work with some complex JSON structures and navigate through. I've, I've found this one uh, invaluable when I've been doing some development with Java, with Java, with, uh, with JSON, and about 20 minutes of your time. The tutorial structure, very straightforward. Um, we're going to basically install JSON.net. Uh, we'll go through, well actually I think these two points are a bit mixed up. Um, the second point there should really be coming first. Um, so what is JSON, why do we use it, and what are the alternatives? I'll go into it in a bit, um, but if you're really like, super interested, there's lots of excellent resources already out there uh, on the net that you can look at. This video is primarily targeting working with C Sharp and, and JSON together. And then finally, the, the sort of money shot, as it were, we're going to deserialize some JSON objects using uh, JSON.net, which is hopefully why you're here. So onto our wireframe, again a very simple wireframe, probably not required, but again I just find it helps clarify my thinking. So in essence we've got two multi-line text boxes, the first one at the top of the screen there. We're going to paste our raw serialized JSON into that window. We'll click the deserialize button and then the output will be um, spat out in the text box at the bottom there in a object oriented uh, nice structured fashion and we'll, we'll pick apart the attributes and work with them individually and you'll see how that see how all that works and i just put a clear debug button on there just to clear the debug window just makes it easier for me when i'm doing the demoing and stuff okay so what what is json well it stands for javascript object notation and it's effectively a an open format used for the transmission of data or object data over the web. Okay, so you make a call to a REST API, you're going to get a lot of information back. Maybe one object, maybe multiple objects, it could be details of people, it could be fault tickets, doesn't matter what it is. Basically serialized data, but in a structured format. And it consists of attribute value pairs as well as array data types. Okay, so an object-oriented concept with uh, attributes that obviously have values and then we can have arrays within that as well. And a JSON object can contain other nested objects. So you'll, you'll see what I mean by that in a minute when we, come into, when we come on to some examples. And there we go, it's time for a bit of an example. So in very simple terms, this is probably the simplest uh, JSON object that you could think of just about. And it basically represents a person. In this case, a fallen hero of mine, uh, Sir Roger Moore, 
Um, I would still say Sean Connery is the best Bond, but I had a very soft spot for Roger Moore as he was the Bond that was around when I was growing up when I was a wee boy, so very sad to see him go this year. Anyway, so I thought I'd pay a little homage to him. So this object represents a person, in this case Roger Moore. In Jason, the start of an object is uh, denoted by a, an open curled bracket, and then the end of the object is closed curled bracket. And in this case, we have four attribute, the bit of tongue tongue twister, four attribute value pairs in this object, and they are uh, comma separated. Yeah, as you can see, the attribute and and the value are or colon separated, but the actual attribute value pairs as a whole are, are comma separated with the exception of the last one which obviously doesn't have one so first name delimit delineated by double quotes as an attribute and the value in this case is roger again it's a string value it's de delimited by double quotes same with last name except a different value and a different attribute name same data type uh, age is a number, so as you can see there, Roger was 89 when he passed away, but uh, as it's a number, it doesn't require double quotes. And then finally, a, a Boolean value, which can take true or false, um, and representing whether he is alive or not, and unfortunately, he is not. Okay, so let's go over to Jason Editor Online and paste in that Jason into the left-hand plane with a little error. And you can kind of see there's a red cross there, saying there's a like a formatting error. You click on that button there to kind of force the error, and it's basically saying we've got a comma where there should be a semicolon. Correct the formatting again, get rid of that, and move it over to the right. And that the right plane allows you to navigate through and see the structure a bit better. There we've got four attributes, and there's the there's the object itself. So a more complex example. Now this is introducing the concept of a nested object. So again, it's basically a repeat of what was on the last screen. We get the same attributes, start of the object, so on and so forth. This time we've uh, introduced a new attribute called the dress. So it's the same as all the other attributes that get there, but it's effectively an object attribute. It doesn't contain a single element, it contains an object of other attribute value pairs. So again, here's the start of the nested object, and here in this case we have three attribute value pairs representing the address. So back in our editor, let's paste that JSON in, this time with no errors. That button that I'm clicking now, it just kind of tidies it up and checks for syntax errors as it were. There's our new nested object attribute. And you can see our, our high level object now has five attributes, the nested object attribute being the fifth one that has itself three attribute value pairs, as you saw on the previous slide. And then finally, this is our slightly more complex one. I've removed a couple of attributes that were on the previous examples, um, notably age and is alive, and one of the address elements, purely for clarity. I didn't want to clutter the slide too much. Uh, I've just taken them out. Um, so this is introducing an array, okay? So you can see here we have a new phone numbers attribute, very similar to the address attribute. It doesn't contain a single value. It contains an array of objects. And arrays in JSON are denoted by square brackets. So phone number is an attribute that contains an array of other objects. And in this case, the object is effectively a phone number represented by a type home and mobile and a number okay that they are themselves uh, objects and you can add in as many of those as you like okay back in our editor let's paste that JSON in with no errors tidy up the formatting and push it over to the right hand plane so we can navigate and you can see our parent person object only has four attributes I, I took out two as I said but you can actually, in this editor, you can actually just go and put them back in. So let's do that, just to show the, the attribute count going up. There we go. Test the formatting. 
No, nope, we didn't want to do that yet. Just put it back in hierarchical formatting. And there you can see your personal object has six attributes now. At address, I took one out, the postcode. So you can see your nested address object only has two attributes. We can put that in. Postcode back in, tidy up the formatting, push it over to the right, and you can see your address object now has three object values. Here's our array. It's got two array items in it. We can put a third one in. Let's put in the work phone number, just to prove the point. This editor I find really useful, especially when you're working with like large JSON strings. It really is uh, invaluable. There we go. So we get three array elements now. Okay, let's move on. And then just to wrap up, I think, if memory serves me correct, before we go into the coding, what are all, excuse me, what are our alternatives to JSON? Again, a bit of a tongue twister there. XML, I'm sure you've heard of that, extensible markup language. Um, I think that was probably around before JSON. It was, you know, when I was uh, just leaving uni, it was the big thing and it was going to solve world hunger. Uh, never quite transpired that way. And I feel just, you know, uh, that JSON has kind of possibly overtaken it now, especially with the the real uptake of RESTful APIs. They tend to use JSON as their data transmission protocol. YAML, yet another markup language. YAML, I've really only come across it in terms of it being used as a configuration file. Um, doing a bit of reading, I don't know that much about it. I believe it's a superset of JSON, but again, if you want to read up more on that, go for your life. I'm not going to cover it here. I've put this one in as a bit of a, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Contentious one. HTML, it's not really a data transmission, uh, you know, alternative to JSON. JSON's really, in the XML are used to transmit data, object data. HTML is really used to trans transfer, you know, HTML pages, but theoretically you could probably use it to transfer data as well. I don't really see any reason why not. And then CSV, comma, separated values. Look, it's probably not going to be used when you were when you would choose to use JSON or XML, so it's probably not really an alternative. But I put it there just as a kind of useful positioner, because I'm sure most people have come across CSV. Anyway. Let's, uh, let's start coding now. Okay, over to Windows and then let's start uh, Visual Studio. Good old Visual Studio. And uh, okay, let's start a new Windows project. Windows project, Windows Forms project. Windows Forms application. Just choose where we're going to save it. And uh, we'll give it a name. So again, uh, if you've not watched any of my tutorials before, I do go through from the cradle to the grave, as it were. I do it all from scratch. So for some of you, that might be incredibly painful to watch, um, but that's how I like to do it. I just find myself when I'm following tutorials, they assume a lot of knowledge and sometimes they miss steps and it can be quite frustrating. And for me, it's not the point of a tutorial. Anyway, so you should be familiar with this. Let's just give our form, uh, let's rename the, let's rename the, the header to JSON parser. And we're basically going to refer to our uh, wireframe screen mock. Uh, that you saw at the start of the tutorial. I do genuinely refer to it. It's not just something that I do for, you know, shits and giggles. I actually do refer to it. I find it really useful. I think kind of more visually, I find. Um, and I, I find them quite helpful. So the top group box is going to host a, a multi-line text box, but I just like to put it in a group box because you can kind of give it a title. Uh, a containing title, in this case, raw, uh, JSON raw, serialized string. And that, yeah, this will hold uh, the text box where we'll paste our serialized JSON, basically string data. But before we do that, let's add uh, our button, our deserialize button. Give it a name again. I 
start all my buttons with CMD, standing for command. And then we'll add a second button where uh, it will basically just clear our second text box window, which is where our output will get spooled to. And I just found it's nice just to have a, a button to clear the stuff that, ne that appears there. We'll add our second uh, group box, again, that will hold our deserialized string, or objectified uh, JSON string, where the magic is going to happen. And we just uh, change the text setting to reflect what it's going to contain, our debug output. Let's just see if that uh, is wired up correctly and everything's anchored appropriately. Yes, and it is. That's good. So let's uh, let's add our text boxes now, and we'll set them to uh, multi-line, and we'll give them vertical scroll bars. I don't know what it is about horizontal scroll bars. I just don't. Uh, I don't like them. I don't like text scrolling horizontally. It probably sounds weird saying that, but I just uh, I find that I'm losing it. You know, I think I'm losing it. Losing my mind, maybe. Um, and we'll just make sure that's anchored appropriately to the group box. So we, uh, we'll anchor it to everything within the group box. And then um, we'll add our second text box as well and do exactly the same with that. This this uh, text box will hold our, um, it will hold our output. Yeah, you're just going back to uh, horizontally scrolling text. Even in Notepad, I always have to turn WordWrap on. It's the first thing I do when I build a new Windows PC. Because, well, it used to be anyway, WordWrap was not turned on by default. Absolutely hate that. First world problems, I guess. So uh, let's see if that's worked. No, no, I didn't anchor the, I didn't anchor the text box. So let's anchor the text box fully. Forgot that. Okay, looking good. Let's wire up our event handlers for our buttons. I like using regions um, just to kind of keep code tidy. In a project of this size, it's probably a bit of overkill, but it's just a good habit to get into. If you've worked on some larger code bases, um, the more things like regions, the better, in my opinion. Assuming you, uh, assuming you name them appropriately and give them a meaningful name and you group things accordingly, otherwise they are counterproductive. And we will do the same with our deserialize button. And we will just basically um, put some text into our debug window and then we can test that the both buttons are wired up correctly and that the clear uh, function works. Let's type something in. Yep, cool. And it is, it's posting down, but what you can see is happening, it's just basically writing over. So it's not scrolling down, it's just, yeah, it's copying the string in, but it's just setting it over itself. So let's rectify that. I've got a, a function that I like to use. For those of you, again, that have watched my videos previously, you'll be familiar with this function. It basically just takes a string and it just scrolls the debug output window. And at the same time, it writes the string text to the Visual Studio's um, output window. It's fairly simple. Fairly simple. It's incredibly simple, but I, I just find I use it all the time. So it takes a string. Okay. Uh, I just like to put it in a try-catch block. I don't think it's ever thrown an exception, so it's probably a bit of overkill, but um, you never know. So in the case where it throws an exception, all, all we'll do is just um, yeah, just write out to the Visual Studio's um, window, the debug window. And we'll just write out what the the exception message was and move on with our lives, shall we? Okay. And we'll add a new line. 
Because that's the kind of nice people that we are. Okay, so onto the meat and gravy of the actual um, function itself. Again, we'll just write out um, whatever string we pass into it to the debug window. Just uh, good practice. And then this is kind of where the magic happens. We'll then um, update our debug text value to what it uh, was previously, plus the new string. And then basically, all we then done a new line as well. And then all we actually do is just um, do a bit of um, scrolling. We just scroll the carrot. To the end, first of all, I think we, uh, yes, we should get the, the length of the, of the text string, and then we just basically scroll our cat to the end. Test that. And let's see the magic working. Oh. No, we didn't wire it up, did we? Okay, let's. Uh, I always do that. I'll write a function and then I don't wire it up to the button. So let's let's make that happen. And uh, we're almost there, people. We're almost there. We've not even got to Jason yet. But again, you'll thank me in the long run. Oh, I don't want to do that. Let's see if it works. Uh, okay. Uh, yep. <laughs> yep, it was that exciting, wasn't it? I can imagine you all jumping round in a similar fashion. I know I was. Now, uh, that's all wired up now, and we're ready now to install JSON.NET. Okay, so go into Tools in Visual Studio, NuGet Package Manager, Manage NuGet Packages for Solution. Now this is the graphical user interface way to install. Just go to Browse to see the packages available. And there's JSON.NET right at the top because it's so very popular. To install it this way, just click on that and follow the instructions. It's very simple. An alternative is to use the command line. They do exactly the same thing. So it's just really a matter of preference. And to do that, you would type install hyphen package and then name the, the, excuse me, the name of the package. And in this instance, it's uh, newtonsoft.json. Uh, how do I know that? Well, um, yeah, brother Google reveals all. And of course, you know it now because you've watched this video. So just hit enter. If I can find my cursor, there we go. And that's it installed. So it just basically installs a package and it adds a reference into our project references. And we can start using the framework now to deserialize JSON. Okay, so let's look at the API that Newtonsoft provides for us. It's really extensive, but it can still be a bit confusing. So just Google um, json.net deserialize. And when my internet connection wakes up, it will take us to that uh, particular page. That actually tells you how to deserialize an object, and that's effectively what we're going to do in our tutorial. But to make it a bit clearer, let's just go to the, the the JSON convert uh, function that we're going to use, the deserialize uh, object function we're going to do, we're going to use. And basically what it does, the one we're going to use is, it takes a C-sharp defined class or type, and it takes a string, a JSON string, a raw JSON string, and it basically deserializes that string into the object that you specify. So if we go back to this example, we have an account class, a proper C-sharp object, and then this call here is going to basically take that template and deserialize our raw JSON string against that class and convert it to that. And that's effectively what we are going to do, okay? But let's take a little step back and we'll build it up using our JSON examples 
And we're going to do a bit of a cheat as well to begin with. We're not even going to provide a, a C-sharp defined class. We're going to cheat a bit and use another option. And then we are going to use proper C-sharp classes, which is the tricky part actually. Defining the class templates effectively is the tricky part. Well, the tricky part that I found anyway. And it may be that the quick shortcut that we use in this first bit here may be enough for you to stop watching this video and go away and do what you need to do. It depends on your preference. Anyway, let's uh, let's write up our own deserialize wrapper function. Wrapper, you know, 50 cent, etc. Um, it's basically very simple. It's just going to take a raw JSON string and deserialize it, or it's going to write out an exception. And I have to say the the exception handling or the, I mean, the the exception handling, the error messaging that this framework gives you is really, really good. It's very verbose and it tells you exactly what's gone wrong. It's really, really good. So we're just going to make a call to the JSON convert deserialize object method call that I showed you just a bit previously. Uh, if that fails, then it will throw an exception and we're just going to write out what that exception is. So first off, we're going to just create uh, a variable. It's not, you know, it's not cast to anything. It's just a, a, you know, an unassigned variable. We'll call it J person, Jason person. Oh, before I forget, let's make a, let's uh, put a using statement into our, our new framework. You don't have to do this, but it just cuts out a lot of typing and it gives us all the, all the JSON.NET stuff straight off the bat without having to write newtonsoft.json. And here's our JSON convert. It tells you there what it does. Deserialize what it does. Now, this is uh, where the magic happens. We are going to not give a specified class. We are going to use a dynamic placeholder. And that basically says, as it says there, it's resolved at runtime. Okay, so we're not passing in a class of any kind. And then we're just going to pass in our raw JSON string. What does all that mean? I hear you cry. Well, let's just, uh, let's just write out what we think our object is if we try to deserialize it using this method. Okay. So what we've done, we've created a, an empty variable, jperson, it's not any type of any kind, it's just a, a, a variable. And we're using the dynamic option of the deserialize object method call, just to take a raw JSON string and try and basically what it does is it creates a, a C-sharp object based on the JSON. It creates one on the fly for us dynamically and it's resolved at runtime. And that may be all that you need to do. And you can, as I say, you can walk off now and, and that's you done. I wouldn't follow this approach, but again, it's the simplest approach and it'll just show you it working. So let, let's just let's just show you it working. So let's um, get our JSON. That's in my notepad++. Plus plus. If I can find it on my second screen, bear with me. Oh. Right, so what we'll do is we'll actually go into JSON uh, Online Editor. We'll just paste the JSON in just to check it for correctness. We don't actually need to, to do this, to be honest with you, but uh, I just want to show you. So that's the JSON we're going to give our deserializer. You can see there's an error. We'll fix the error here. Yep, so that's all good to go. All right. Copy that. Paste it in here. Raw JSON, just a string, deserialize it. There you go. It's DC. Now it looks you go a well, big deal, but basically what it's done is it's actually taken that string and converted it into an actual C sharp object. And the beauty of it is we can paste in any JSON now into that window, assuming it's syntactically correct, assuming it, it's okay. 
that deserialized function will just convert it into a JSON object for us. It's very, very powerful. And we don't even really need to do the error checking because again, if we put in a bad string, that one's okay. But if we did put in a bad string, which we will do in a minute, the deserializer will actually throw us an error, a very verbose, very uh, descriptive error. It's really, really great. So again, you're probably going, I'm not, I still don't really get what we've done here. So what we'll actually do is we will output just an individual value of an attribute. Let's just do that. And this is the power. This is the power of using an object-oriented notation, using a proper object. So here's our JPerson. You will notice that there's no IntelliSense drop-down. The compiler's just kind of taking our word for it. It's not throwing up an error, but it's not giving us any help either. Let's see if it works. It should do, because it's correct. So it's deserialized our object and it's brought out that attribute for us. We've used our object notation to peel out that individual attribute value. So let's do another one, just to labor the point. We'll pull out an address attribute and it uses again, object oriented notation. It's just one sort of, you know, nested item deeper. But again, you'll notice it's, you know, the Visual Studio environment isn't really giving us any um, you know, IntelliSense drop-down options that you would usually expect. It's just taking our word for it because we're using the dynamic way of deserializing. It doesn't know what the object is at this point. It only knows at runtime. And assuming you got the attribute names right that match the name of the JSON string, as we have done here, it pulls it out correctly. We've deserialized the string and we're accessing it in an object-oriented way. Let's just try that. And we get nothing. Doesn't give us an error, but it just says, well, you know, there obviously wasn't an attribute of that name. It wasn't in the string. There's nothing there. Okay. So that may be enough for you. Maybe you can go off home now and do something else. But for the rest of you, let's let's take a peek back at this. The example specifies that you actually should use, or can use, should use a proper C-sharp class as a template. It's almost like saying, here's my C-sharp class. I expect when we deserialize this JSON string that it's going to adhere to this class. And when you do that, you then have all the IntelliSense drop down and all the good stuff that goes with classes. So let's create a very simple class just to hold our first example, JSON. Let's just paste it in here as commentary, just so we know what it is we need to build. Oh. Okay, so that's obviously not part of our code. That's just so we have the code, or the, have the JSON on the string. And we're what we're gonna do now is create a C-sharp strongly typed class as per the introduction, using proper data types, all that kind of stuff. So let's start coding up our C sharp class. So public string, first name. And it's important to note that the attribute names in our C sharp class, person class, should match the attribute name of the JSON that we're expecting. It's quite important that they match. So again, public string will do last name in the same way. It's just a string. And we'll do the same for our age and is a live attribute, but we'll change the data type. So this again, this method, you're creating a proper C-sharp class, you're giving it proper data types, uh, strongly typed, all that kind of stuff, all that good stuff that you want from object-oriented programming is available to us using this method. But again, it depends what you're needing to do, and maybe the other, the other method is, is, is preferable to you. Let's just get rid of that for the moment because the code's kind of self-documenting now. Build's okay, I would expect it should do. So um, what we will do is we'll make a call to actually, we'll leave that there. I just want to leave that there so you can have a bit of a comparison. And I'll basically just copy the majority of the code, but we'll take out the dynamic keyword and we'll actually put in our proper 
typed class. You probably should change the variable to that class as well, but let's just leave that just now. Let's make the call and just print the object, see what happens. There's our JSON. Hmm, interesting. So not an error, but it just prints the actual name of the object. It doesn't actually print the contents like the the last time. And I, th I suspect that's something to do with the way the Newton Soft guys have implemented the, um, yeah, implemented that method on their uh, objects. So not necessarily an issue, but what we'll do is we'll actually drill down into our attributes. And there's the difference, okay? Because we used a strongly typed C-sharp class, we have access to those attributes in an IntelliSense dropdown, as you would expect. Because we were telling it, it's a, it's a particular uh, type. Let's paste our JSON in. There we go. Roger has returned. We've interrogated the object. The, you know, Visual Studio is kind of, you know, knows what the object is. And that's why we get all the IntelliSense drop-down stuff. Let's just get rid of that line and actually reuse the code we used previously. It should be exactly the same. And indeed it is. Cool. What happens when we do this now? Should it work? Oh, it doesn't. Why not? Because we're trying to access an address object that does not exist in our class yet. We have told the deserialize method that we are passing it, or we expect to deserialize a, a simple JSON person. We are trying to access an attribute that does not exist in that schema. It worked fine with the dynamic because you could basically throw anything at that because it's resolved at runtime. So let's resolve that now. Let's create another class. And what we'll do is we'll just copy all this stuff over. I'm not using inheritance. And a lot of you are going to be freaking out right now. What is inheritance? I hear you say, well, I should be using it and I'm not. <laughs> But I will, don't worry, I will come back and correct it. So basically, this is a, set, a totally separate class that's based on our previous class. So it's all the same previous attributes. But now we are defining another class within it, our address class. Let's just paste in the, in the JSON, just so we have a reference, okay? So we want to create as you can see there, we're creating a another class within our existing class with three attributes in the same way. And again, we're copying the attribute names exactly over. They're all strings. Okay. So you should be starting to get the hang of this now. So I found this the hardest thing when I was using this was what do our classes look like in relation to the JSON that we are going to get in order that we can deserialize them correctly. And I suspect it's what trips up a lot of people. The dynamic option is good, but it probably doesn't quite develop your understanding enough. So there's our address class with our three attributes. Okay, and then what we actually need to remember to do is add our top level uh, class attribute of type ADDR, but the attribute name has to be exactly the same as the JSON in this case address. So um, fifth object attribute address of type ADDR. Let's get rid of that. Don't need it anymore, code self-documenting. Okay, get rid of that. Just check the JSON for completeness. Yeah, that's all okay. It looks good. And let's see if we can. Uh, oh, I thought I got rid of that. Let's get rid of it for now. Build our solution. Okay. And what we'll do is we will um, now try and deserialize some JSON using that 
actual object that we've just created. So we'll just create another one of these lines, just again, so you can compare with what we did previously. The pattern should be emerging, but here we go. We're just replacing the class with the uh, JSON person complex class. Let's paste in. Oh, no, didn't want to do that. I didn't want to do that either. But there you go, the DC realizer doesn't like it. So it's working to some extent. I thought I'd copied that text. Let me paste it in. Okay, there we go. Let's see if we can deserialize that. Yep, there we go. So we're getting Roger back. Let's just uncomment that line that wasn't working previously to give us the street address. And we'll just show you the, the yep, there you go. So you can see we have our address attribute with the three child attributes. And that, that's really the whole point of why we're doing this, you know. Build it and uh, let's paste the JSON in. There we go. And we're getting back the address, street address, from using a strongly typed class and passing it to the DC Eliza. So now let's re-enable our dynamic method. We'll rem out the line we just created and we'll use the uh, dynamic approach. Just test it with that JSON. Yep, that all still works, cool. Using the dynamic approach. And what we'll do is we'll just copy in our most complex JSON object with the array structure and that, and we'll see if the dynamic approach can handle it. There you go, there's an array of phone numbers. And it does, it just, you know, it prints all out. But how do we actually get to those attributes individually like, like we have done with the street address and like we have with the first name? Well, we have to iterate through the array using a for loop, basically. And let's just start that code now. So we're just saying that we're going to attempt to cycle through our phone numbers and then we'll begin our for loop. Now again, as we're using the dynamic approach, we are, there's nothing strongly typed. And this is why I, I like the, the actually providing classes because I find that you're flying a bit blind in the dynamic approach. You don't, you're not really getting that help from Visual Studio, which is one of the main reasons I, I like it so much. I know other developers like using text editors and having absolutely zero help. I, I don't get that. I need all the help I can get, basically. <laughs> so, yes, we're going to be printing out the phone number and the phone number type. Uh, and let me just check. Yep. What a bit of uh, this is my notepad, behind the scenes notepad. Uh, let me look in online editor. Paste that JSON in just to see the yeah okay so it's uh, type and number yeah okay so again you've got to get those attribute names exactly correct and you're not because you've not got a class with those associated um, classes defined you have to kind of make sure that it's right in the code because you're not getting that help or that validation in, in the code if you're doing it this way but hey it works so let's just run that. Paste our JSON in. There we go. So using the dynamic method, we're posting in our most complex JSON structure and we're pulling out individual uh, phone number uh, object attributes in that array. Now, as before, we're going to comment out our dynamic um, line, the use of the dynamic uh, keyword. And we're going to actually, once again, create our third and final class JSON person array and it's our most complex class that we've created and we're basically again we're not using inheritance just yet we're just going to copy our entire code from our previous most complex class and extend upon it okay and I'm doing this just to keep keep the code more readable and so you can see how it's developing over time so again in a similar way uh, that we created the address so a subclass, we're now creating a phone number uh, subclass, or phone num subclass, and we're giving it two um, attributes, type and number, both of which are strings. 
And again, like with the address, we're going to have to add it as, a, as an actual attribute of our main uh, JSON person array class. So we have six class attributes in total. Just checking that's correct. Okay, so here we go. Let's put it in as our sixth attribute. So phone number. And the actual attribute name is phone numbers. So the type is phone num, the name of the attribute is phone numbers. Again, it's got to match exactly. It's the same pattern that you've seen before, nothing new. Nothing new to see here, move along. Great, great, all done. Looking good. My phone's just uh, thinking I'm speaking to it. So let's... Uh, that's what that weird noise was. So let's uh, make our third and final actual call using that class and deserialize JSON against that class. And we should be able to reuse the code we've already created for our dynamic, uh, dynamic approach that we used. But we're getting an error. Why, why is that? Did we not define something correctly? So let's just uh, go back here. Yep. So there is the phone number attribute in our JPerson object, but it's not liking it. What's what's wrong? What do we have to do in our class to make it work? Right, it's a very, very simple thing. All we actually have to do is make this uh, enumerable type, and I'm just choosing a list in this case. So that's effectively telling us it's an array of phone numbers. Like, like we see here, it's an array. The address was a single nested object, but the phone, num phone numbers are an array of objects. I'm not sure what the limit would be in JSON. That's an interesting question to ask. So let's just paste in our JSON and see how we get on. Okay, and we have Success. Okay, so I did promise a bit about inheritance. Um, it's not really what this tutorial is about, but it's really important and I just thought I wouldn't want to leave the example as I have without at least mentioning it. Now, um, if you know about it, then obviously this is rather pointless. If you don't know about it, the concept of inheritance is quite simple. So. What you see on your screen at the moment is how we have implemented uh, our software. So forget about the address class and the phone number class for a moment, but just think about our three main classes that we created. The first one we created had four attributes, and then the second one we created was effectively identical to that, but it introduced this additional attribute. But we copied all the attributes from the first one into the second one and and we repeated the same pattern for the third class it basically had all exactly the same attributes as the previous class and the class before that json person simple but it introduced progressively more and more attributes now that's okay and it does work but what's the problem with that well number one it goes against the kind of concepts of inheritance and object uh, oriented programming it's kind of a self-fulfilling thing but the practical reason or well, one of the practical reasons why you would choose not to do this is say for example the json string that we are now going to expect to receive the vendor um, that provides that json to us has decided to combine first name and last name into just a single attribute full name we would then in our software implementation have to change three of our classes in three different places to reflect that change which, number one, it's a lot of work. Number two, it's prone to error, blah, blah, blah. It's just not a good design, okay? So with inheritance, inheritance actually kind of solves that problem, which is what you're seeing on your screen. Now, this is the model if we use inheritance. Okay, so thanks for watching. Good night. No, I'm just kidding. Um, so yeah, this is the model that we would use. If we were going to use, we're going to implement this in a couple of seconds. It just looks a lot simpler, does it not? Yes, it is. And basically what you'll see is we have the same three classes, JSON person simple. In fact, the JSON person simple class is exactly the same 
That does not change. That's what is referred to as our base class. What we're then going to do and what the arrow is kind of denoting is that our next class, the JSON person complex class, will inherit everything from its parent, from the base class. And it can then introduce its own attributes, it can introduce address, it could introduce anything else it likes. But the the benefit of that is that we don't have to copy the code. I mean, I suppose technically it's sort of being copied, but it's being inherited really. It exists in one place and it's basically referenced. I suppose that's a better way of describing it. And then when we come on to doing the JSON person array object, it's exactly the same concept. We just need to inherit from parent class, which in turn uh, inherits from the base class. So for JSON person array, we don't have to inherit twice. If you know what I mean, we don't have to inherit from JSON person complex and then do a separate inheritance, if you like, from JSON person simple. The inheritance is implied all the way up the chain. So you only have to inherit from one place and you get everything that has gone before. So inheritance is actually a great term for it. Whoever decided that was the term that they would use for this concept. Um, so yeah, let's go on and implement that in our solution now. Okay, so here's our first class, very familiar. Actually, here's a second class, should I say. Let's, we won't remove it. We will remark out the four attributes that we're going to inherit, leaving us just in this class, leaving us just the new implementation. So how do we inherit? Very simple, colon, and then the name of the class that you're inheriting from. It's that easy. So basically saying this class, a complex class, is inheriting everything from a simple class. And we can even peek at the implementation to see what we're going to pull in. And bear in mind that uh, those attributes are remarked out, so it's just commentary. I've just left them there for, for readability. We take them out. And we only have to implement the new stuff. And then similarly with um, our array-based class, we can take out everything that's gone before. We can just remark that out. And we only need to keep in, include the new stuff, which is basically our phone number attribute and the associated class. So we just rem that out. Okay, and it's just the new stuff that we need to keep in. And again, we just inherit from the complex class this time. We could actually inherit from the, the simple class, but it would mean we wouldn't get the address stuff. So you could, you could inherit from that other class as well, but you probably would want to do that. So let's just test that out now. So we're still using our complex, uh, sorry, our array-based class. And it's just basically showing you that because we've inherited, it's still going to work as it did before. It should not change. He says, yeah, there we go. So it's all all working fine. And it's just what we wanted. Okay. So just to wrap up a, f a little bit on error handling capabilities. So here's our simplest JSON object with our error, comma, instead of a colon. In our online editor, we get nice verbose errors. What happens when we run it through our code? We we'll fix it up there, but we won't fix it up here. What do we get? we get? We get quite a nice error. So it's pretty good. Let's fix it and see what we get. So we get another error. So the JSON is looks correct. It's syntactically, it's fine. Why are we getting an error? Well, it's quite simple. In our code, we are trying to access an address element within our JSON which just simply doesn't exist. So although the JSON we supplied was syntactically correct and our class is correctly defined, sometimes you may do all that stuff, but, and it's happened to me, you'll get a JSON payload without certain attributes, because that can happen, especially if it's coming from a third party, you can't control what data you're going to get. So if we run this through our uh, deserializer again, that particular error should pass. Let's do that. It does, but we're getting another one. Because again, in our code, we're trying to access our array of phone numbers, which we're not providing either. So if we provide that JSON, which we'll do, it will run fine. There you go, it will 
that's trying to do that. So what I'm saying here is, you know, you might have defined your classes correctly, you might have some sample JSON, all works great. And this often happens when you're testing stuff, it works great. As soon as you put it into production, you start getting random edge cases. Yeah, so that, that works, okay? So it's just a bit of a gotcha. Even though your JSON is well formed and your classes are perfectly written, you sometimes have to test to make sure that you're actually getting values returned back. Right, so we're at the end of another video. Um, I really appreciate you taking the time to watch. I know your time is valuable, so I do appreciate it. Um, just showing you my uh, website or my blog, that's just a WordPress blog, binary thistle all one word dot com it's on the screen there and basically for every video that i do i always put a blog post up and they're quite detailed it has the code it has the diagrams it has some more detailed explanations and some of my terrible jokes and sense of humor up there so please yeah stop by have a look uh, leave a comment or leave a comment on the youtube channel I always love to hear um feedback it's uh, it's great and it gives me ideas for uh, my next video. So um, thank you again and I'll see you soon.